Um, thanks for being here tonight. And um, I'm looking forward, uh, I hope with you too, to hear about a place on the MIT campus that's gonna become an epicenter for innovation. So I'd like to introduce back for the second time, um, we did this in 2011, I think it was, right? September 2011, uh, when um, at that time, Professor um, uh, Vladimir Bulovich came in and talked to us about nanotechnology and specifically about applications in solar and in storage markets. Um, now he's back as Dean Bulovich, but he wanted me to mention that he still does research, even though he's a dean. So he is, uh, hasn't ascended to the ultimate heights yet. Still down and dirty and making things work. So. Um, Anyway, he's gonna tell us about the MIT's newest building, which has been named MIT Nano, uh, and the amazing research that's going to take place there. When fully occupied, it's a $350 million building and will house up to about 2,000 researchers from multiple technical disciplines all over campus. So it's gonna be really a center. It's actually physically located at quite a central point. And uh, it's gonna be kind of, like I say, the, one of the epicenters of innovation at, on the campus because of the interdisciplinary capabilities that exist. Now, I've known Vladimir for about seven years now, and I've watched how he has risen from being just a recognized authority in applied nanotechnology for devices such as thin films and optoelectronics to a major leader at the institute level. Um, he is head of the organic and nanostructured electronics lab. And you'd expect that, right, from a, from a tenured professor who's been in research for quite a while. He's also co-director of the MIT ENI Solar Frontier Center, which is a very big deal, for those of you who know about that. He is the co-director. He was the co-director, maybe, I guess I would say. But, but I think he was really the leader, actually, uh, to implement MIT's first ever uh, energy studies minor, which required getting five schools and was it 17 or 18 departments? 20. <laughs> 20 departments, sorry, I undercounted, right. They all had to agree that yes, this is the curriculum that we wanna to put together. Uh, and the curriculum was from all of these different departments, you know, to be able to make up an energy minor that was really steeped in practical application. So that was no mean feat. And now he's co-leader of the MIT Innovation Initiative, which is another really big activity within the Institute. And if that's not enough, uh, he's also the mastermind of, and uh, I don't know, I'll call him the program manager, general contractor, or whatever, for this amazing building that he's gonna talk about and, what it's gonna, and what's gonna be done there, and all the equipment in it. So, so uh, which probably a full-time job for most people. And yeah, along the way, uh, he's found time to receive over 80 US patents, author over 150 research articles, and found three companies, two of which are out here in the Bay Area. And there's probably more, and I'm not mentioning all the awards that he's won and everything, but the one that I took notice of the most and I really like to see is the McVicker Award. It's for teaching excellence. And he won that too, back in the days when he was teaching. So anyway, um, how fortunate are we to have him here today? I think very. So let's welcome MIT's Dean for Innovation, Vladimir Bulovich. Thank you. Well, it, it's an honor to be back here. Uh, and indeed, last time I was here, I had a chance to tell you about nanotechnology and energy. I'll, I'll mention that today as well. But really, uh, the reason why I'm here is to tell you about nanotechnology in general. The building we are building is just a veneer for my reasons for being here, because it turns out nanotech is something that is so omnipresent and so indeed utilized by everything we do that we might not even realize that we have been using it for hundreds of years um, in what we do every single day. And yet today we look at it and we say, wow, nanotech, that's really advanced. It is, it's actually really advanced. And the reason why it is so advanced is because we finally started seeing what we are really doing all this time. Last 25 years uh, be, uh, mark the beginning of the nanotechnology era, where we finally actually saw things under a microscope. I mean, just think of it. When we first predicted the DNA, it was based on the X-ray or E-beam diffraction pattern that we were seeing off of the DNA. No one actually saw DNA. We just inferred based on the K 
K-space spectrum, what is it that it must look like? When you finally saw DNA, well, that was a different moment, right? That happened sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, right? When we finally were able to see using either atomic force microscopy or scanning electron microscope, the actual features, the actual size, the actual items that all this time we were inferring. And that's when the moment, that's the moment that the world opened. That's the moment that we said, wow, you know, we can really see stuff at this scale and we can finally understand what's happening down there. So the way I look at it is I say, well, you know, past 25 years have been a time where we poked the nanoscale. Like we saw individual molecules and quantum dots and polymers and we were extremely excited to move one of them to the left, a little bit to the right, stack one on top of the other, make a chemical rea reaction between two atoms, right? <laughs> And then you say, well, all right, now make a trillion of these. Well, I, I can't do that. Because <laughs> really what I've done is I spend a tremendous amount of time, right, as a community. We spend a tremendous amount of time trying to understand why things look the way they do down there. Well, now's the time to actually start implementing all those fantastic findings. And we already have. And you're going to see them through a variety of examples I'm going to try to go through. Now, a really good thing to do uh, as we think about nanoscale is maybe to ask how big is nanoscale? And I know many of you are very technically savvy in the audience, but you know, it nevertheless, uh, it's instructive, I find, to uh, actually just give a comparison, um, especially for those who might not necessarily appreciate how small nano is, right? So if you look at the width of a hair and compare it to a width of a house, typical hair maybe on the scale of 100 microns, typical house maybe on the width of 10 meters, that's the ratio of 100,000 between a hair and a house. If you go and compare a carbon nanotube that's one nanometer big to the size of the hair, that's also a ratio of 100,000 between those two. Indeed, nano world is extremely small, and this is just one way to show it. Take your hair, slice it 100,000 times. But you've seen nanoscale all around you. I mean, if you've ever seen a stained glass window, you're staring at nanoscale. Stained glass windows are made of well, metal nanoparticles that are mixed inside glass. Now, I can ask you, have the art, art, you know, artists, uh, stained glass artists of the 16th, 17th, 18th century really known that? Well, no, they had no idea. They knew that you need to take the rock from that side of the mountain and mix it up with a little bit of, of uh, hair of a, of, of, a, of a yak and you know, put in a, a few drops of milk. And if you cook it at the right temperature, you might get actually yellow color coming out of this thing, right? And or green or blue or whatever it was, because what you were doing is causing formation of nanoparticles of metal. Nanoparticles that are on the size of about three to seven nanometers, let's say. And depending on the size of a nanoparticle, you generate a different so-called plasmon resonance. That plasmon resonance causes the absorption of particular part of the spectrum, passing all the other light through, hence coloring the stained glass windows that's illuminated by sunlight. Hmm. Well, you know, have I seen nanoscale elsewhere? Well, yeah, I'll show you a couple of more things. So, for example, here is a nanoscale. This is a uh, pigment. Anything, anything that's colored, any single colored shirt you see in this room, it's painted by nanoscale size molecules. If they were any bigger than nanoscale, they would be dark. They would be black like this because the electronic resonance would spread over more than a few nanometers. And then that means that the energy, col the color of that molecule meaning its energy levels would be shifted towards infrared, absorbing all the light, the hence black. Make it nano, and you're going to be able to give me optical resonances in the part of the spectrum that I can see. So if you see a colored object, it's because it's colored with a nano item known as paint or pigment. Now, you also might have other kinds of nano items, maybe even in your pocket. So here is um, an example of a nano item. Um, it's a glowing pickle. Uh, it's electrified um, by applying 110 volts through those two electrodes, one on top of the other. And what's glowing are atoms, sodium atoms, inside the pickle. You're injecting electrons and holes, generating extons. You can slice the pickle really, really thin, and you make an organic LED screen. And if you have a Samsung Galaxy phone, <laughs> well, the benefit is that you don't need to apply 110 volts to get the field to operate the pickle, well, to operate the slice pickle, you, go, you can get away with five volts, right? So OLEDs operate at five volts because they're so, so very, very thin. Now, they don't really use slice pickles for those of you who really want to know how these things work, but they use actually luminescent dyes, molecules that are scales of one nanometer, and they are spread around in a thin film format. You apply about five to 10 volts, even, even less, and you'll get glow coming out of it. The remarkable thing about OLEDs, by the way, is that we can 
control the actual structure of an OLED precisely. OLED, organic LED, is only 100 molecules thick. And the middle 10 molecules are the place where the glow comes from, where the light comes from. And it turns out in those 100 molecular layers, we put 50 of one kind, 10 of another kind, 40 of another kind on top of that. And you can do it like this. Hence, you can sell it as a commercial item, right? Otherwise, it'd be way too expensive. Because we can manipulate nanoscale easily today. Well, where else can you see nanoscale? Actually, it turns out many, many places. For example, those of you who ate mayonnaise, anyone? Yes. <laughs> so mayonnaise is made of oil, water, and eggs. And doesn't taste like oil, water, or eggs. It tastes like this silky, buttery, uh, you know, just wonderful thing to uh, have on your, on your, uh, on your sandwich. Um, and really what it is, is a colloidal emulsion of about 100 nanometer size particles made of, indeed, proteins that happen to be available, assisted through the mixture of the oil, water, and egg to give you the particular nanostructure that gives you that subtle feeling on your tongue. Hmm. Well, <laughs> you can keep on going. You can keep on saying, well, where else have you seen nanoscale? And maybe... Maybe even, who's the first quantifiable nanotechnologist that you might cite? <clears throat> well, the first time people have actually started using nanoscale is clearly a long time ago. And uh, you can look, look at, for example, Damascus steel uh, that was used for making amazing blades uh, that were just so rugged and sharp and never dulled. And you can say, well, how come? How come they worked so well? Well, they worked so well apparently because, and you know, no one knows how to make Damascus steel anymore. And that's because likely they ran out of the original ore, because really it was that ore over there, now we know, that had a, quite a large quantity of carbon nanotubes that's responsible for the sharpness and the durability of the Damascus steel. If you look under the uh, skin electron microscope, you'll see features of carbon nanotubes that are present in there. That is what made them special, right? And when the ore ran out from that side of the mountain, no one else could make it as good as, and the recipe was lost, right, on how it was made, right? Because it was many years ago. Well, where else might have, I have seen it? Well, the first nanotechnologists, maybe that quantified the experience of nanotechnology, uh, lived, uh, at least as much as I could find, uh, lived in the 18th century. Uh, and he wrote, uh, he, was observing, he was observing on his sea voyage, going from Europe back to America. That's one clue. Um, in 1760s, uh, he was observing that the water behind the ship was very, very calm, while the water around the ship was not. And then he noticed that the cooks on the ship were throwing all of the leftover food or oil or whatever else they had overboard. And indeed, that was in the wake of the ship behind it. And that was the quiet part. Now, he opened some books and realized that indeed, during the ancient warfares, during the time of Greece, um, they, they actually used this trick uh, to stabilize the boats. You know, essentially, if you want to have a calm sea, just throw some oil on it. And then he got ahead and found a pond, took a teaspoon of oil, and observed it spread. And he says, you know, a teaspoon of oil covered about half an acre of a pond. If you take a teaspoon volume and divide it by half an acre, you can type it in Google, it uh, comes out to 2.4 nanometers. He essentially observed that oil had spread, forming a molecular thin film, 2.4 nanometers thick. And the surface tension of the slick of oil is what was calming the waters underneath and giving you that still um, glassy-like um, uh, quiet ocean to work on. And uh, he wrote this back in 1762, an American scientist known as Ben Franklin, yes. <laughs> the first nanotechnologist that I could come up with, at least the one who quantifiably looked through the numbers and realized exactly how small of a scale was a thing that he was just, just made in front of himself. So, the opportunity, I guess, to explore the nanoscale is this is extremely broad. And we see it no matter where you look, right? So if I look today and ask who at MIT is using nanotechnology to advance their particular breed of science or technology or engineering, and you can find out that it's essentially in every discipline that we pursue at our university or at any other university or in any other industry. If you look at medicine and life sciences, if you look at energy systems, at computing, at manufacturing, at materials and structures, quantum science technology, all of it, all of it has nanotech embedded in. Indeed, what we do at MIT is education. And you know, the reason why uh, we pride ourselves as being as MIT is really resting on the shoulders of the successes of our alums. 
Because our alums do so well, we do extremely well in attracting the next generation of alums known as our present students. <laughs> and so, it, in so many ways, our opportunity for growing MIT comes from your successes. And hence, if we can come up with a way to educate our present students, so when they step out into the world, they can be much more effective. Well, I've just generated the yet another generation of future alums in the form of next students will be attracted because the present ones have done so well because we figured out how to teach them what truly matters in being implemented in the world. I've done a, a, a little informal survey on my own. I looked through the names of the last 10 years of tenured faculty in the School of Engineering and School of Science, figuring these are young faculty recently tenured, so they'll be around for the next couple of decades running MIT, right? And I ask a very simple question. You know, if I go ahead and look through the list of names, 140 names of 1,000 professors. Um, we have 1,000 professors at MIT. 140 got tenured in the last 10 years. In the School of Science, what fraction of them would choose to use nanotechnology as the main means of advancing their research? So in School of Science, it's about 51% of the recently tenured faculty. Well, you know, but they're scientists. They always look at small things. So let's take a look at School of Engineering, which is responsible for about oh, I don't know, 75% of our research at MIT. Um, <clears throat> so at School of Engineering, 66% of the uh, young faculty use nanotechnology as the main means of what they are researching in order to understand, is it bioengineering, is it chemical engineering, is it electrical engineering, is it material science and engineering, any discipline we touch. So nanotech, if I'm going to find a single force that unifies us, it is indeed nanotechnology and nanoscience. That's going to be the definition, of, just like math, and computation are omnipresent, nanotechnology is just as omnipresent in what we do. Now, that's simply due to the fact that we already have plenty of nanotech things around us. I just gave you some of them, but you can keep on going. I mean, you can ask, how come my shirt doesn't get stained anymore very much? Well, it doesn't because maybe I'm a little bit uh, nicer eater these days, but beyond that, it also has a nanotech coating on every fiber of my shirt that uh, simply whisks off any kind of stain. I can ask, how come I, my pants don't wrinkle anymore quite as much like they used to? Again, it's the advancements of the name of technology understanding that led us to where we are right now. So again, how come your, your, when you go and wash your clothes, they glow you know, brighter than white? <laughs> they actually are glowing brighter than white because they're absorbing, absorbing sunlight and glowing back. That's why they're brighter than white, because they have these little phosphors, nanoscale phosphors, inside your uh, detergent. How big is the detergent molecule? Oh, it's nanoscale. Mm. <laughs> Go figure. Oh, uh, how about this? Smells. How big is a typical thing I smell? <clears throat> so a benzene molecule is uh, this big. It's uh, on the scale of about, well, look at that. Well, not quite a nanometer, but almost a nanometer. Now, that's, each one of these hexa hexagons in this picture is also a benzene um, or benzene-like molecule. So this is also the same size, 0.3 nanometers across. And take a look. These are the typical scents you might come up with. These scents are no bigger than a nanometer in size. And that's not surprising, because if they were bigger, the molecules would be too sticky to leave, to leave the surface they are stuck on. They would not be very volatile if they are any bigger than a couple of nanometers in size. And hence, I wouldn't smell them, because they would not be in the air that I'm breathing. A typical scent is a nanometer in size. I can ask, how big is the typical receptor in your nose? It's about 10 nanometers in size. <laughs> As it's, and there are about, uh, I believe, about 10,000 different receptors, at least 10,000 different scents that you'll be able to um, recognize uh, as, you scent, as you smell things. So it sounds like nanoscale is everywhere. So you can say, say well, how can I actually use things like this? Well, my colleague Tim Swagger, for example, realized you can use it in quite a number of ways. Uh, you can, for example, think about smelling ethylene. And you can say, well, why would I care about smelling ethylene? Well, ethylene happens to be produced any time the fruit is ripening. As the fruit gets riper and riper, there is more ethylene in the air emitted from the fruit. If I can smell ethylene, I will know if my crate of apples is ready to be sold because it has ripened to the right amount. And if I smell too much ethylene, I'll know that it's too late <laughs> to sell that crate of fruit or vegetables because it started rotting at some point. It turns out about 10 to 15 percent of all of the produce in the warehouses of the United States rots because we don't recognize that it's ready for sale. If instead every one of them had a little tag and the tag was able to recognize the ripeness of my crate of fruit, I'll 
walk around with my, with my little iPhone uh, and uh, go ahead and figure out which crate to sell, because everyone would be tagged with that, its own ID and a chemo sensor. A chemo sensor, in this case, uh, made, made by C2Sense company that uh, Tim developed with his students. And all it is is uh, essentially uh, a, a resistor that has carbon nanotubes bridging the two electrodes of this resistor. Carbon nanotubes that are dressed with receptors for ethylene, nanoscale receptors. Upon ethylene attaching itself to the receptors, the conductance of the particular chemoresistor changes. And hence, you have a recognition of that. Ethylene is in the air. You need to calibrate it, but that's the next step. So nanoblocks that you can imagine using, many, 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 right? We have discovered a whole series of them over the past couple of decades. And this is by no means a complete list. This is just some of the things you might have heard. So how can I use some of these things? Uh, let me show you. I mean, I already showed you organic LEDs. Uh, I might as well show you a few other unusual ways of thinking of how nanotechnology might be used. Medicine often is one of those things you don't recognize that nanotech can be tremendously powerful in. But you are smelling things on nanoscale. You are tasting things on nanoscale. When you see light, you are seeing nanoscale elements. A typical wavelength of light is half a micron, 500 nanometers. You have nanoscale receptors in your eye that actually are able to respond to those optical excitations. Um, here's another application. This is a, a video of a mouse that has been injected with infrared nanoparticles. The tail of the mouse was, first of all, illuminated because that's where the particles were injected first. And then they spread throughout the body of the mouse. You can see the beating heart. You can see the arteries. You can see the lymph nodes. Well. These nanoparticles are infrared emitting nanoparticles. They are about three to five nanometers in size. And when, when illuminated with infrared light, they glow back their own infrared light. Infrared light happens to readily go through your skin. Visible light doesn't, that's why we see our features. But infrared light can go deep into your skin without you ever knowing it. Huh, that's why you kind of can get warm, right? <laughs> Under an infrared lamp as it penetrates deeper into you. And if there are these nanoparticles inside you, They'll glow back. In a matter of seconds, you'll be able to map out the entire cardiovascular system of the mouse as they spread through the body of the mouse. They'll eventually get collected by a kidneys and get expelled out of the body. But for right now, you can imagine, well, all right, I've just figured out where the, the blood flows. One thing I can also do is I can go and attach to that particular nanoparticle, every one of them, I can attach a little molecule, and it's going to be a cancer tagant a molecule that will attach itself, recognize, and, and attach itself to can, uh, carcinogenic cell inside, if, if there are any inside your body. The value of that is that every one of these molecules that has a cancer tagant, that it has a quantum dot or a little nanoparticle attached to it, will go ahead and bring along the nanoparticle to wherever the carcinogenic cells are. And I can now illuminate the mouse, and the part that glows is where the carcinogenic cells are. So from perspective of removing the lymph nodes that possibly are carcinogenic, I'll know exactly which ones they are. Because those are the ones that happen to be glowing because ha we have chosen to engineer this whole little nano item known as a molecule in a little nanoparticle to go and give us this new functionality because we understand the optical properties of our body. Our body is transparent to infrared light. And we can engineer the scale of the nanometers, this new emissive elements known as nanoparticles. All right. Well, what else can you do? Well, here's another one. This is, a, in medicine, a use of an entirely new scalpel that my colleague Yo Fink has developed. Now, it's a light scalpel. You can think of it as a lightsaber, because <laughs> it's actually powerful enough to slice you. Um, but it, it is used as a scalpel, as a very precision tool for cutting and operating. It is a fiber that is made of nanoscale layers of different dielectric materials. And so you make what is known as a distributed Bragg reflector or a really, really good mirror. You can choose particular thicknesses of these layers and leave the middle hollow and then pull it into a fiber just like this. And what you can then do is you can inject into it light, infrared light, 10 micron carbon dioxide laser light. And the cool thing about 10 micron light, it actually is not particularly high optical energy, but you can send a lot of photons. And those photons will essentially, uh, you can use CO2 lasers to cut steel, if that's what you want to do, if you have a very strong CO2 laser. You, uh, typically, clothes or jeans, fabrics are cut by them, because it's very quick and easy to do. 
skin can be cut by the CO2 laser, but it's coming out this little fiber. And so as a result, it can be focused to a spot that's as narrow as 10 microns. And I can choose the intensity of the light so I can ablate only a micron of the skin, or deeper, or deeper if I want to go. And on top of that, if you go ahead and cut the skin with a CO2 light, the blood coagulates. The blood exposed to CO2 light, 10 micron light, uh, simply hardens. And you stop the bleeding. Now you can operate, for example, inside your lungs, if needed, to remove a lesion without, blood, uh, without flo flooding the patient with all the blood that would typically be rushing if this was just a typical scalpel cutting things. An entirely new way of thinking how to use interaction of light and matter, enabled by the control of the nanoscale, and now providing an entirely new tool that's been used in over 100,000 operations over the last seven years of uh, use of this particular technology. Um, indeed, some of the surgeons would swear by it as being the best scalpel that uh, they've ever used. A very different way of thinking. Now, you can use the very same fibers, but make them even smaller, these omniguide fibers, because they have a hollow middle, so you can pass medicine through the middle. And our, our colleague Polina Nikeva is looking at using them, together with Yol Fink, to uh, actually bridge severed neurons. Is this a way to cure paralysis? Is this a way to, indeed, enable people who can't move to bridge uh, uh, wherever there happens to be a cut in their n neural network. There is a whole new field of so-called optogenetics that has been merged over the past few years that recognize that optical stimulation of neural cells can cause reactions of those cells. So you might be able to one day cure tremors or maybe understand Parkinson's disease a little better, uh, all because we can finally directly interact through optical field with our physical cells that actually make us operate the way we do. There are many other things you can think of doing in, in a nanotech scale. Medicine, um, I already mentioned a whole different ways of doing medicine. This is another one. This is uh, looking at electrospinning to make medical structures that are either perfectly round and globular or purposely rough. This purposely rough structure is same medicine, but because of its shape, this one has a lot more surface area and hence will be more readily absorbed by the body. It will more easily dissolve it because liquids will more easily penetrate into it. This could be used as a time-release medicine, if that's what you want to do, by controlling the nanoscale of the material set. Or here's another one. This one, you know, I'm a electrical engineer, so I look at things uh, in energy and electricity and optics quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> but the one thing that is stunning, this is from a couple of years ago, um, source uh, April 2012. If you look in uh, 2010, about 1.3% 1 of world's electricity was used on cloud computing. Uh, if cloud computing was a country, it would be country number five in electricity consumption. And then the, 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 the uh, concerning predicament is that we would like to have more computing around us. For example, you heard of Internet of Things, right? <laughs> I love that. I mean, I love the idea that we can have everything interconnected. And indeed, um, <clears throat> apparently you can buy now Barbie dolls with a Wi-Fi connection <laughs> in them if, if you really want to. Um, but the point is that from perspective of Pro proliferation of the cloud computing and Internet of Things. There is a perspective that by 2020, we'll need about 1,000 times more cloud computing than we do today. So if we don't change the electronic paradigm that's running that cloud computing, that implies 1,000 times more, 1,300% of world's electricity will be needed to run that world. A bit of an issue, right? Unless we can figure out how to redefine what computation really means. Is it through quantum computing that we're playing with right now? Is it through the fact that if you actually look at the typical electronic circuit, you know, every, you have all those transistors, right? Only 100 electrons actually make the transistor turn on and off. But to actually actuate one of the transistors, you need to send 10,000 electrons into it. Why? Because the wires that connect the transistor to the next transistor use 99% of the energy that uh, you utilize inside a typical computational system. So instead of using electrons, can you use light to do computation? Can you use spin states of matter? Can you use excitonics and excited states of matter? All of these are options that we're right now exploring. The one little challenge we have, as you probably know, many of you are technologists in this room, anything that's made of hardware, anything that's physically touchable, takes about a decade to take from an idea to impact. Um, Zipper, I believe, took about 15 years.
from the invention of a zipper to the actual deployment of the zipper at a millionth scale. Velcro, I believe it was 17 years. <laughs> and you can keep on going. I mean, a uh, the first computer about 15 years. And it only took off because MIT put it on Apollo missions that actually succeeded. So you know, computers were not a gizmo. They were actually can fly spacecraft and stuff. So they must be real, people said after that. Um, but there are options, right? I mean, there are options of using nanoscale, like this uh, nanowire transistors that my colleague Jesus works on. Where else is nanoscale important? Well, how about concrete? Concrete is responsible for about 10% of global greenhouse emission. Why? Because concrete is made of calcium and carbon. And in order to actually make concrete, you spend a lot of energy the, being able to make the perfect mixture. Well, so how can you actually help out in some way using nanotech? Well, concrete is so strong because it has a particular nanostructure of chemical bonding that makes polycrystalline domains that happen to be just right to make a strong building. Well, how can you change the, uh, the cr crystalline structure of those domains? Well, you can do it by putting either more calcium or less calcium, more carbon or less carbon inside it. And if you hit the right ratio, you'll make it extremely strong. Uh, last year, we, uh, MIT group, uh, led by Franz Josef Ulm and colleagues from both civil engineering and material science, realized that the usual composition of cement is not the strongest composition of cement. If you actually adjust it, you one can reduce the CO2 emissions of the making of the composite, and you can make stronger buildings. Why? Because finally someone actually looked at the nanoscale and checked out through nano indentation and other mechanical properties of the nanoscale on how to make a macro scale item like cement work better. So that is quite a significant advancement. Or, or take a look at this. This is another nanoscale technology. Um, this is a typical ketchup bottle um, that um, my colleague Kripa Varanasi is very fond of. And then he says, well, you know, I'm really frustrated with the last little bit of ketchup not coming out. So <clears throat> can I go ahead and imagine a technology that would allow me to have a ketchup bottle that easily squeezes the last little ounce of ketchup out of that particular uh, bottle? And indeed, in this way, Kripa will now save us, oh, I don't know, 10 to 20% of all the ketchup in the world. <laughs> Indeed, you can keep on going, and you can say toothpaste can also benefit in the same fashion. Um, the technology that actually is right now available today, uh, or will very shortly be, is Elmer glue. You'll find that the Elmer glue will more easily come out of the, uh, uh, the actual bottles, thanks to the fact that Kripa has figured out a way to use a nanoscale coating inside those bottles to give you the particular slippery nature of those particular bottles. And I asked Kripa this very uh, question. I said, you know, all right, you know, there is this new ketchup bottle you just gave me, but what's going to change about the ingredient list of the ketchup? I mean, heck, you put more stuff inside the bottle, so you should tell me what's in there. He said, nothing. I'm like, well, how come? He's like, well, you know, I, I'm just using the sugars and starches that already are inside the ketchup. I'm just choosing to nanostructure them and coat the surface with that first before putting the ketchup inside. There are no additional components. There is a nanoscale structuring that was never there before, and that is what gives me the slippery nature. And you can say, well, well, that's really cool, but is it good for anything else? Well, yeah, it is, it turns out, because it turns out when you burn coal or natural gas and make steam that turns the steam turbines, well, the friction between steam and the steam turbine is responsible for 10 to 15% loss in the energy conversion from the heat to the electricity. If you can come up with a coating on those blades, nanoscale coating that would make the less friction between the steam and the blade, that would be a good thing to do. Let me think, do I have a technology for it? Oh, yeah, I do. The same technology could be applicable for that. And then you can keep on going. Condensation can be affected. Evaporation rates can be affected. I mean, there are many, many things that through the very simple understanding, well, deep understanding, but simple application of what happens on the interface of a nanostructured surface and an overlying liquid, you can change many things we do. And hence, you can look at the world and you say, well, you know, energy consumption as we know it has always increased as you go from era to era. But I would guess that come 2050, or what is this, let's say 2025, <laughs> certainly by 2050, but even in 10 years from now, the nanotechnology man that is right now in his renaissance years as he's trying to figure out how to launch new technologies based on the nano era, well, the nanotechnology man will actually live exactly the same lifestyle of today, maybe a little bit richer in the experience, but at about a half of the energy footprint of what we do today. 
because we have a tremendous amount of inefficiency in today's systems. Is it um, in the way that we generate electricity? Is it in the way that we drive the cars, right? I mean, only about 15% of the energy of gasoline gets converted into motion. That's 85% waste, right? That's on average in the gasoline burning engine. Electrical engines are much better. Uh, it's about 90% conversion from electricity to motion. So, you know, switch to electrical motors. As long as we can figure out how to run the world on electricity, we should be able to dramatically save the energy footprint that we live in. Or look at very simple things, lighting. About 20% of global electricity is used on light bulbs. That's a lot of electricity. And if you actually look at the energy consumption or efficiency, incandescent light bulbs clearly are not the very efficient ones. That's why they're so hot when you touch them. Because 95% of their energy goes into heat, five into light. You do better with light bulbs like uh, fluorescent, but they have a little bit of mercury inside, so that's not good. White LEDs are even better. You know, you can get down to 35% efficient systems if that's what you want to do. Often the challenge with white LEDs is the color. We don't like the blue-yellow glow. And that's actually one of the um, first addresses that we've done. We try to redress that by looking at uses of colloidal nanocrystals, little phosphors that when optically excited, they glow their own color. So you can start with an incandescent light bulb. That's how a bowl of fruit would look under it. You can go ahead and uh, compare that to a typical blue-yellow cool white LED, and bananas stop looking quite as appealing. But if you actually paint that blue-yellow LED with a little bit of a red phosphor that it converts some of the blue light into red light, you can recover the color spectrum of your LED back making it exactly the same as incandescent light, but using only about one-sixth of the energy that an incandescent light bulb uses. That's a good advancement. And also one that is aware of the fact that these are human-centric objects, things that need to illuminate our life. And as a result, should be adjustable for the pleasure of the humans who need to use them. <laughs> so we can use the most efficient versions because we like using them, right? Or here, here is your future light bulb um, in a little bit different format. This is a quantum dot electrically excited LED that uh, should be just as available uh, in a store near you. Well, give it about five years, <laughs> maybe 10 from today. Um, but there are already those kinds of items. I told you about organic LEDs in a form of cell phones. People are looking at organic LEDs not because, just because they're awesome the way they look, high contrast, super trim, uh, ultra fast, uh, pure color, you know, a curvable if that's what you want to do. But also if you look at the watts per square inch consumption, the consumption is dramatically reduced in an OLED or quantum dot LED compared to any other technology. The big challenge, clearly, of this technology is actually manufacturing, coming up with ways to make things like this. Um, although this particular display, this is a 55-inch uh, ultra-high-definition OLED TV, looks awesome. I mean, this is the best-looking TV out there. Um, it costs mere $25,000 <laughs> to buy. Um, the co costs are all about manufacturing. So there is actually a little company in the valley here called Cativa, that uh, is uh, developing a so-called yield jet platform. They've done this for the past eight years, um, where they looked at ways of, indeed, commercializing manufacturing of nanoscale layers needed for OLEDs. Here, here are their tool sets. They're just down, down the street in, pa uh, in uh, Palo Alto. Um, but uh, what you can see is, uh, is a two meter by two meter piece of glass that is coated by molecular films. And uh, indeed, this is the first uh, mass production tool delivered last, uh, last uh, quarter. Here's a video of one of those tools operating, uh, moving around a two by two meter piece of glass. And then this is a print head with thousand nozzles that uh, prints the entire area of this particular two by two meter piece of glass in 90 seconds. Um, and what you're putting down is 100 molecular layers on a two by two meter piece of glass. That's typical control of nanoscale we should expect as the future unrolls. And as a result, you know, tools that are quite massive can provide us entirely new ways of thinking about what energy is for us or what nanoscale can provide us in the energy domain. Four years ago when I was here, I've shown you this video, but I love it so much I'll repeat it. Um, those of you who have seen it, hopefully enjoyed it first time, maybe you'll enjoy it a second time. It's a video of a solar cell that's made on a piece of paper that has been inkjet printed with organic dyes. Paper is a substrate. Organic dyes are actually car paints, blue and red car paint. You use them every day, not as semiconductors, but in this case we do. 
You can then go ahead and take that piece of paper that's been painted with organic dyes and electrodes, shine light on it, and this little electronic appliance will turn on. You're powering that particular clock using that little piece of paper. That piece of paper now can uh, be treated just like any other piece of paper because it's a piece of paper, <laughs> and uh, yet it's solar active. So the stress test we perform here is to pass it through a laser printer because it's 300 Celsius cycle. We'll choose to fuse the toner right on top of the cell to see exactly how much abuse can the cell go through and still perform reasonably well. Let's see, attach it, shine light, still works. Now, you can try that with silicon, and I'm not sure it's going to necessarily perform the same way after passing through a laser printer. But you can now imagine having power essentially anywhere that you wish. You know, is it any surface you touch? Um, places like this actually would dramatically benefit from uh, having such a solar cell because this solar panel, the way it arrived in this village, is uh, on this kind of a road. Cars cannot go on that road. It has to be on someone's back. And this person carrying that solar cell really doesn't care what's the efficiency of the cell. What he cares a lot more about is how many watts per kilogram am I carrying. So give me a lot of watts per kilogram. So give me a cell that's half as efficient, one-fifth as efficient, but it weighs only one-hundredth as much. That's a 20-fold benefit from perspective of, of utilization of the cell. As a matter of fact, this is the likely the most expensive thing in a village, likely to get either damaged or stolen, so being able to roll it up at the end of the night or <laughs> and stash it away so it can be unrolled the following morning is actually a feature that's beneficial rather than just leaving it as a panel outside. Um, here is another one of the versions of the, such a cell. This is a semi-transparent version of, that, uh, of a different solar cell. This is a quantum dot solar cell. It's been NREL certified to be a 9% power conversion efficient solar cell. This solar cell itself, in this case, we made it semi-transparent because we want to make a coolest of uses of the cell. We want to reimagine what a cell like this can be used for. For example, a pair of shades might be a useful thing to consider. And you can say, oh, that's a ridiculous thing. No, no, listen, here. Illuminated by, by, by uh, room light, you can power on the left side one of these electronic clocks. Oh, you can do actually both sides, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> And you can say, well, that's, again, silly. Well, it actually sounds silly, but from perspective of hearing aids, 4 milliwatts is what you need to power a hearing aid. Batteries for hearing aids need to be replaced every few days. One of these panels of my solar cell can generate a few milliwatts of power. Plenty, actually, power. This is a 1% efficient version of a cell that would give us 4 milliwatts. We have at least 4 or 5% efficient cells in the particular rendition I just showed you there. And that's also plenty for a Bluetooth radio if you don't need hearing aids. Uh, again, the leads are right next to your ears of this power source known as your sunglasses. Now, sunglasses in a room like this, I might not be the one wearing sunglasses. So is there something else I can do using nanoscale to give me an even different types of energy technology? And here is another one. This is uh, another solar cell. In this case, it's invisible. Again, using nanoscale films of molecules. Now, it's invisible because it doesn't absorb any visible light. It does absorb infrared light because we have tailored the nanoscale structure of the molecules to give us this particular absorption. Visible spectrum goes through. UV and infrared light gets absorbed. The absorbed infrared light generates electricity. And so here is another video. This is a um, Kindle that has been outfitted with one of these transparent solar cells. So you can look through it and actually see the image on the Kindle screen. Whenever you uncover the screen, light is absorbed and you generate, this is 10 volts coming out of this particular panel. Whenever you cover it, the voltage goes down to zero volts. Now, it'd be good to show you exactly how transparent this particular transparent solar cell is. So let me unsnap it. Oh, oh look, uh, that's your solar cell. It's a piece of glass. And as a result, you can imagine that, well, if you're wearing glasses, that's where you can get your four milliwatts, if that's what you want to use. And one day, beyond this Kindle, and you know what? I chose Kindle because it turns out even with a 1% efficient cell, you never, ever need to charge your Kindle again, ever. <laughs> because in the course of a week, in this light, dim light, you'll be able to get enough power to recharge the battery of your Kindle. Kindle battery lasts two weeks, so one week is plenty. Now. I can say, well, that's brand new technology. Uh, is this the best way to introduce it? Yeah, actually, because you're going to break your Kindle <laughs> in about three to four years. 
I, that's plenty, because it turns out my cell will last that long. It's a brand new technology, so I can't guarantee 20 years operation, but I can guarantee three to four years. I've already done that. And so from perspective of value proposition, this maybe is a good way to go. And indeed, we started in Redwood City just last uh, fall. We opened a little company called Ubiquitous Energy that is playing with this technology. Playing, I mean, they're actually making first demos and identifying first markets so they can penetrate so that one day they can do this. If I can coat a building, a skyscraper of a typical office building with a 5% efficient cell, and by the way, we should be able to reach about 12% in the ultimate version in a few years. 5%, this skyscraper, a quarter of the electricity of the skyscraper can be provided by the windows that you're looking through anyhow, right? <laughs> so, and how thick is my structure? Oh, about a micron, maybe a little bit less if you actually count uh, the exact thicknesses of all the layers. So uh, just a little thin film of nanoscale elements that indeed in this case generates electricity. So these are the types of things. I mean, I could have told you a lot more about the actual way that, and I, I will, I'll show you some images of the actual way we are pouring the foundation and choosing the HVAC system in this place which we call MIT Nano. Because I spent my last three and a half years learning the craft of macro science, being a nanotechnologist. This is, I'm the obvious choice to build you something big, right? So from perspective of, of what we're going to be able to do, this is MIT Nano. It's situated, just to give you a, a sense, uh, it, it is, we see it as the key innovation center for MIT campus. As a matter of fact, this is the biggest project for this decade uh, of development uh, on campus. And it will affect, as Doug mentioned, it will be used by 2,000 users. Oh, by the way, there'll be not a single faculty office inside this building. Oh there also will not be a single student office inside this building. Oh, and none of the tools will be owned by any individual faculty members, although many will be the ones to, to curate them. Why? Because this is a central facility. It's a $315 million building with $50 million of equipment. None of us as individuals can afford that for our own individual groups. But as a community of 2,000 users, we can definitely afford that. And it's meant to be transformative. It's going to double our clean facility space on campus. It's going to double our imaging cap capabilities on campus. It's going to develop a whole set of new tools that right now we know some. And by 2018, when the building opens, we'll have additional ones. And then next decade following that, the building will be outfitted and renovated over and over again. The building itself, once it's structured and built up, it will stand there for 150 years. However, in year 2050, roughly speaking, we'll rip everything out of right now MIT Nano, and we'll, we'll replace it. Because by then, we'll have anti-gravity, right? <laughs> we'll have a variety of quantum computing tools we don't even imagine right now. Technology changes every year dramatically due to the understandings of basic sciences and then applications of that to the practical technologies, right? So from perspective of making a flexible space that can evolve and not be owned by anyone, but owned by the community of MIT is indeed what we need. I often get asked, you know, when I distinguish MIT's culture from other universities, I often emphasize when a, a visitor comes by and they say, you know, I, want to, I met Professor X, Professor Y, Professor Z, I met you, Vladimir. I said, well, you missed the boat. I mean, it's nice that you saw me. It's nice that you saw a few things I do. It's nice you saw a few things other people do. But you missed why we're so good if we, if we are perceived as being good. We're good because we work as a team. What's much more effective at MIT is to give us a problem to me. And then what I'll do is come and find three or four colleagues from chemistry, material science, and physics. And we'll address it as a team that looks at it from every different angle. The culture of MIT is that unity, unifying force. Actually, you know, incidentally, in 2000, uh, <laughs> 2016, we'll celebrate 100 years of the old campus, the old Bosworth buildings that initially were built in 1916 when University moved from Boston into Cambridge. And by accident, they built one large structure that now is known as the main court and the infinite corridor. That was an accident. It wasn't an accident. It was a choice. The choice that was meant to make things simple for people to go from one to the other laboratory. And indeed, it became the key to the seamless integration of the disciplines across MIT. One of my closest, I'm an electrical engineer, but one of my closest collaborators are in chemistry, chemical engineering, and material science, because to get to their offices is just going down the hall, taking a left, taking a right. There are no boundaries. <laughs> I, read, I read once an article uh, in, from Psychology Magazine that talked about anytime you have to open a door, 
you apparently forget 20% of the things you meant to do. Well, so if you need to step out of your building, open two doors, right, because there's always a breezeway, and then step into someone else's building, open a couple of more doors. Man, by the time you reach the guy's office of your collaborator, you really have forgotten what you're all about. Plus, you are standing on his turf. Often, the buildings are separate between physics and material science, electrical engineering, and have their own cultures that might be alienating to anyone else. Not at MIT. At MIT, everything looks just about the same as you go around. <laughs> Just about the same. That gives us a chance to actually go from one space to the next without ever feeling like we are not on our turf. And hence, every discipline easily blends with every other. So a place like MIT Nano, that's at the epicenter of the campus, is designed to explore new science, invent new technologies, and prepare the next generation of leaders. We do see the responsibility on us of figuring out what the 21st century is about. We've done it before for the 20th century. We'll certainly see the responsibility of trying to figure out and help in the 21st. The building itself, if you cut it open, you'll see the following. You'll see that it has two levels of clean rooms. A clean room is typically actually two floors tall, because one is a fan deck and the underlying level is where people work. And then uh, the quietest place is in the basement. That's for imaging, for seeing things down that are small that you built up here. And then, the most importantly, take everything you've done here. Take, take the basic science, basic engineering, and actually make it something you can hold in your hand, a prototyping space, a place for synthesis. You can call it an extraordinary maker space, space that actually takes the nanoscale and brings it to the macro scale. So those are the tools we are right now developing, imagining, and going beyond the usual development. So if you take a tour here, the entrance of MIT Nano is um, uh, the, inf uh, if you uh, go under this breezeway, you would reach the MIT dome. Uh, that's the infinite corridor right there in the back. You can uh, step into the lobby, and first thing you'll see is large windows that will look into the clean room. Why? Because we want to make sure we show the cauldron of innovation known as MIT uh, and show all those sparks flying around that are happening inside the clean room spaces. At the same time, there is also a point of showing to these guys in white suits that there is life at the end of the tunnel. I mean, there is <laughs> indeed, you're, you're, you're doing this for the sake of rational, normal people that you can be once you step out of the clean room and actually wear regular clothes and see maybe a tree branch that's green. Consequently, allowing you to recognize this is for the impact to society, not just because you're developing the next set of technologies. Um, it's instrumental to us to actually build teaching spaces throughout. The clean room itself will be outfit, outfitted with video feeds, a variety of teaching tools inside, but also around, the, for example, imaging spaces down in the basement. They have natural light because we want to make sure that it feels good to be down there. But also, we want to make sure that you can be right next to a, an imaging room, start an experiment, display it on the screens right here and assemble a class right, right outside it so they can see science in action as the class is being taught. Another thing that's really important is to actually mesh engineering, hands-on experiences with numerical experiences. And so uh, the bridge that connects building 16 and MIT Nano uh, is used for central visualization and teaching space, a space also known, some of people would call CAVE, computer-aided visualization space, that would bring numerical scientists, theorists, and accidentally cause them to rub shoulders with the experimentalists that are right next door. And through the human friction, develop more than either one can do on their own. There are some beautiful lobbies that allow us to actually con connect MIT Nano to the uh, neighboring environments. And a new courtyard that gets generated between the infinite corridor that's right here. That's the infinite corridor. The dome, MIT dome, is right down here. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, indeed, this particular courtyard animates the ability to actually step out of the infinite corridor into this greenery, and then step back into the Building 16 if that's what you want to do. And this is how it would look if you're walking around the periphery of MIT Nano looking down onto the courtyard, or if you're in the courtyard itself and the trees have not been trimmed. <laughs> this is how green and lush it might be. Um, indeed, it will be transformative. And we will open up what we do as nanoscientists and nanotechnologists to uh, others. Uh, we very much are cognizant that this will be a centerpiece. We want to make sure that people see nanoscience in action by looking at the clean rooms. Exhibits, a nano gallery um, uh, will be readily observed. If um, I, I, I'm standing actually right in front of the windows of the glass lab. I don't know if how many of you have seen glass pumpkins that our students make by actually taking glass and melting it and then pulling it, and in, it or, or ingots in a casting lab that is done just right next door too. If I turned around on from this site, I would see the glass lab. This has been re recently renovated. And so you can see the macro scale 
development, and then you can step into the nanoscale or right across the courtyard. If you want to know more about MIT Nano and what we do every day, um, we pull stories from the MIT News website and uh, tell you about how the building is being constructed. Um, here's uh, Dennis Grimard. Dennis uh, is, um, joined us in January from University of Michigan. He built the NanoFab there, and he saw the challenge of building the MIT NanoFab as an even, even grander challenge. Incredible guy. Just, we call him the juggler, because uh, just like most of us at MIT, he has a dozen hats he needs to wear in order to build a building uh, effectively. Um, we, what we have done, we spent about nine months thinking about how to make also the most energy efficient clean room ever made. And indeed, at this point, we are almost certain, actually we are very certain, we'll be able to get LEED Gold certified. That's, un that's a very, very hard thing to do for something as energy intensive as a clean room. But through a variety of energy payback analysis, we realize we can invest a lot now to get a payback in energy savings in the long run. To build a building, um, <clears throat> well, the building is right here. All of these are already existing buildings. If I want to drive a truck to uh, pull the dirt out or deliver the piece of steel, I need to go under this building, through this courtyard, through this narrow neck, and uh, come to the site. This is the worst possible site for any builder to build a building. As a matter of fact, if I'm going to ask you, uh, you know, what's the entry point? Well, this is the actual entry point. The entire building needs to come under here <laughs> or under here. <laughs> this is 13 feet. This is 12 feet. It's a building a ship in a bottle. That's uh, the easiest way to describe it. Um, and we have done already, starting in June this past year, uh, the enabling work, because uh, all the infrastructure of the campus is old, 60, 70, 90 years. Uh, consequently, we need to, to upgrade it to uh, accommodate the new building. Here's uh, the view of MIT Nano uh, site. This is building 12. This building was built in 1943 uh, by the Department of War. Uh, you might also have heard of the radar lab, uh, building 20, that now is building 32. The Stata Center is on its site. Building 20 was the radar lab, right? This was a chemical engineering lab, a place where new chemical business was going to be developed for the needs of the war. Now, it was built in 43. I'm not aware of what was exactly built in the building. We just know that there's a lot of mercury in the pipes as we're pulling out this particular... I asked about it, and I'm told by my chemical engineering friends that mercury is a low, uh, uh, low vapor pressure solvent. So it's clearly we use it all the time. <laughs> so um, the, yeah, I know. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, uh, the building after the Second World War was uh, uh, given to the chemical engineering for its, uh, as its headquarters indeed served like such. This is the view without windows, because those need to be pulled out first, because we had asbestos around the caulking. Um, and then this is the view a few months later, actually a few weeks later. Um, this is a view a few days after that. <laughs> uh, another recent view from a couple of days ago. You know, I, I actually, I really enjoyed the following video as I, that I took. Uh, let me pull it out. Uh, okay. Let me see if I can play this for you. This is a um, MIT Nano um, a construction. So there's these incredible tools that they bring. They're hosing it down because they try to minimize the dust that is released uh, in the air. And uh, this guy who's manipulating this incredible crane has a, a, a micron precision in where he puts this. Oh, there he goes. Oh, oh, oh. So uh, my office is right next to this. It's just, it's a wondrous thing. <laughs> it's an absolutely wondrous thing to observe. Um, every day, there is yet another excitement. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, the next thing to do, and this will happen fairly quickly, um, we'll be digging out the foundation uh, this year from April to, uh, to, uh, through the October. Um, in order to do that, uh, there'll be truck every 10 minutes uh, passing through the Thunder Pass, about 40,000 feet of slurry, uh, uh, square feet of, of cubic feet of slurry wall needs to be injected. Um, 1.4 million cubic feet of dirt need to be removed. And then a uh, truck every 25 minutes between October this year and December uh, this year as we are uh, starting to actually build the foundation itself. Um, next thing, steel. Uh, steel is going to take about four to five months to put up. Now you have a skeleton of the building by April next year, in about a year. And then about two football fields of glass, stone, metal pan panels need to be put up to uh, make a box. Following that, from August 2016 through roughly speaking December 2017, we need to lay down 35 miles of pipes and 190 miles of electrical wiring, and then the rest of a few things inside the building itself to complete it. Opening is in spring uh, 2018. 
And the building, MIT Nano, uh, will stand up and open up the campus to opportunities we never had before, uh, or actually, come to think of it, no one ever had before, considering the opportunities we'll try to put inside the space. So this is the place, um, and now's the time to actually apply it and build it. That's all I want to say when it comes to nanotechnology for right now, but I'll gladly take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. So um, we're going to start out. Wait, we're going to start out with um, some of the prepared questions that you gave us through online registration, and then we'll move to opening up to the audience. We have we'll have two roaming microphones, one in each aisle. Um, so be thinking about what you want to ask, and we'll, we'll take care of all the questions that we can. Um, okay, so I'm going to pick three of them here, and um, oh, let's do this one. So please describe in the next the next three years nanoscience applications that we could expect to find deployed in electric and water utilities. <laughs> All right. I think I've sh already shown you a whole bunch of electric and water utility uses. Um, uh, Kripas technologies, uh, the, uh, indeed slippery coatings of liquid glide, uh, are being utilized right now, at least they're being experimented right now, in a variety of energy technologies, for, uh, for example, for uh, preventing fouling in reservoirs. Uh, in um, um, boilers, in, uh, for uh, assisting in condensation, in, in condensers. Um, you'll find uh, desalination uh, advances that uh, nanotech will also be uh, helpful with. There are recent advancements in uses of uh, graphene uh, membranes to come up with very effective desalinators. There is uh, solar will clearly be omnipresent. Actually, one little known fact I mean, my view on solar, by the way, and on May 5th, MIT will release uh, the study of the future of solar study. Uh, I happen to co-chair it, and we've been working on it for the past five years or more. We, we don't want to admit. Um, it took us a while to understand the future of solar, but actually, the future of solar, the way I look at it, is business as usual is actually really good for solar. And I can say, why, well, why is that? Well, in the past dozen years, the gro growth rate of solar deployment is on average 43% growth, 43% interest rate. That's the way you can think of it. So at this point, over 1% of world's electricity comes from solar panels. And, and if we keep on growing at 43%, by 2025, 115% of world's electricity will be coming from solar, right? <laughs> so business as usual is the way to go. Now, there are a few challenges to actually maintain such a high, high growth rate. A lot of it is based on storage. So development of storage technologies is one of the most urgent uh, needs. Uh, and there are many imaginative ways people are looking at that. Um, indeed, uh, solar will be one of the elements that comes in, but there will be plenty others. I think wind, uh, it will certainly play a very dominant role as well. Uh, there are hopefully enough answers in that answer uh, that I can stop on that question. But if you want to know more, I'll gladly answer them offline afterwards. OK. Um, next question was, please address the pros and cons of microstructure and nanostructure for manufacturing and its use in 3D printing. Mm. Well, so, <laughs> so I, I guess what excites me the most uh, as I'm thinking about MIT Nano right now is, yes, we'll have amazing tool sets, and yes, we'll unify the disciplines. But in some way, that is business as usual for MIT. We already unify disciplines, although we'll be able to do it even more effectively. We already addressed a whole slew of opportunities on a nanoscale. What I'm very excited about, though, is asking, you know, here's a $350 million building. You can't have that everywhere. I mean, that's a unique tool for a unique place. However, one thing you can ask is, well, the thing you can build everywhere is typically a machine shop. Things like lathe, drill press, 3D printer, laser cutter, those are things you find in a prototyping space, makerspace. 20th century makerspace, I would claim. Because I think what's about to come is what I would call a 21st century makerspace. We can very well, in today's makerspaces, manipulate mechanical elements, wood, aluminum, whatever it is that we're machining. We can also very well put together electrical components that are pre-made for us, resistors, capacitors, if we choose to, Arduinos, right? If we choose to do that. What we can't do very well is manipulate light, for example. Why? Because we can't easily or at least we don't have tools to easily pattern micron scale features. If we could, we would. And it turns out there are some very simple, straightforward 
tools you might be able to imagine. How about this? You know, a colleague of mine, Carl Bergen, suggested this to me the other day. He said, uh, a couple of years ago, actually. He said, you know, uh, for 60 bucks, you can buy a Blu-ray disk drive, right? And it has a blue laser. And it can find a spot on a Blu-ray disk that is half a micron by half a micron in size. That's where the song begins, right? Or movie starts playing. Well, we can already manage to find, with that blue laser beam, a half micron by half a micron spot for $60 item. <laughs> well, what if that blue laser is what we right now use in lithography to polymerize monomers and hence use it as a lithographic tool to generate patterns on the disk that doesn't have to be a Blu-ray disk but can be your substrate for, uh, out of which you would like to make an optical circuit of waveguides and photonic band gap structures. Can you do that? You should be able to. There's no reason why you shouldn't. It's just a matter of choosing to develop that kind of tool. Can you use your thing sublating tool that can give you accuracy of a micron placement in hole and width of that hole to again generate optically new types of systems? If you can manipulate optics, what other tools can, what, what other things can you do with it in your maker shop? Can you come up with ways to make chemical surfaces that are patterned to be hydrophilic and hydrophobic? You can, through stamping, through printing. That's actually quite, quite doable. Often we don't do that because we don't think of it. But you can do it and you can come up with amazing new technologies. Just look at Kripa Varanasi's work, right? Again, on the nanostructure, the hydro hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity of the surfaces and what that can do for you. You can keep on going. I mean, if I can inkjet print not just metals in the form of metal nanoparticles and insulators in the form of plastics, what if I can inkjet print semiconductors like some of the recent organic PV or organic LED semiconductor materials can be done? Well, now you can actually directly print semiconductors to make integrated circuits of a variety of kinds. I mean, that would be the machine shop of the 21st century that would be transformative and educational beyond what we can do right now and not cost very much more than what today's maker shop looks like. So that's my thought. Thank you. That was a very insightful question. Too. Ah. <laughs> um, now, this last one's a little more conceptual in nature, but um, it's an area that I think a lot of people find very interesting. And, it's, and the question of it is really about the process of innovation. So the actual question said, how does one develop the capability to innovate, especially among engineers and scientists in an R&D enterprise. Um, and so, I mean, even though it's not specifically technical in nature, I think it's a really good one because if you can't innovate, all this wonderful stuff, you know, doesn't do you any good. So, well, so uh, on that. thank you. Uh, it allows me to express my knowledge of being the dean for innovation. Um, <laughs> the uh, no, actually, I, I've. Foremost, I'm a researcher and scientist, and that's where my value is in the world. And once in a while, I dabble into these other opportunities that people ask me about, and I'm delighted. I'm very honored to have a chance to really think of it. And actually, I have to say uh, that uh, for the past year and a half, I worked extremely closely with uh, my colleague, Tiona Murray, who's uh, dean, uh, associate dean for innovation in School of Management. Uh, there are only two associate deans for innovation, her and myself. And what we do is combine our knowledge. Her, she actually studies innovation she uh, runs the, school, the uh, Trust Center for Entrepreneurship and understands innovative processes quantifiably. And then my job is to kind of hack through innovation, build a company, figure out what physically works. And one thing you can recognize if you combine those kinds of understandings, you realize that the innovation itself, the process, has changed over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, it, decade, two decades ago, we could graduate students and know that there would be a corporate lab that would teach them how to apply the knowledge they took and build it into products and impact. Today, those corporate labs are not quite as plentiful as they used to be because there's Bell Labs or IBM Yorktown, HP Labs. You, you keep naming, right? Labs that actually take fundamental knowledge. <laughs> I, I didn't, I, yeah. <laughs> labs that take fundamental knowledge and actually think about how to apply it and develop it are very, very few. And that is because the innovation system of anything hardware takes a decade first three years of the decade are typically in universities, and next seven are typically outside universities and used to be in corporate laboratories. Well, but not anymore. Now, the make, to make money, right, the right thing to do is to focus from a corporation point of view, last couple of years of innovation cycle, years nine and 10, eight, nine and 10, let's say. And maybe in year seven, approach a startup and say, little startup, if you can make a display that has this many pixels and this thin and use this kind of power, 
I'll buy 20 million of those displays from you next year. A big company can say it to a little company. And a little company will work really, really hard to go ahead and try that. And a little company, a little engine that could, right? Maybe they'll deliver. And if they do, fantastic. Everyone is happy. But if they don't, the little company can just spend all the money they had trying to meet this one target for one opportunity. Likely they'll fold. And all the knowledge and human capital will be dissolved. And all that effort that otherwise would have typically stayed inside the old form corporation will be di dissipated and not easily reproduced anywhere else. And those extra years, that, that those middle years of development that startup had would have been not particularly well spent time as the team is dissolved and knowledge is gone. So that's in the world, the world we live in right now. So as a university, as an institute, our obligation is to make sure when our students step out into the world, they know how to build things. Not just have the basic knowledge of, I have really good grades. We should send them out with a maker portfolio, something that says, here's my CV and here's my maker portfolio, things I've done while I was at MIT, and these are the things I intend to do as I step out. We do see a dramatic rise of our number of students, undergrads, that have stepped into these startups. It's about 12 or 15 percent of all of our grads now step into startups as the first thing they do. It used to be 1 percent, if you asked me 10 years ago. So okay. innovation cycle has changed. <laughs> so we're going to open it up to the floor now. So raise your hand, and that will be the first question right there. Microphone's coming. Thank you. Thank you. I, about 15 years ago, I saw an architectural presentation when NIST built their nano building, and a lot of the emphasis was on massive slabs on shock absorbers and controlling room temperature to a hundredth of a degree. Is that still important with the current technology in a building like this? We went to NIST, uh, so the question is, uh, yeah. We, we, we went to NIST to actually see the best practice, and they have an extraordinary site. It's isolated from the rest of the world, it's underground, it's, uh, you can't step into some of those labs because they're class 10, because uh, just a few cells of your body will pollute the environment, and that, uh, just the heat of your body will change the temperature of the system. Uh, we will not have that. Uh, you know, very simply said, uh, the best cleanliness we can maintain, given the fact we have graduate students, <laughs> is uh, class 100 clean rooms. Uh, so our chases are um, class 1,000, our bays are class 100. There'll be local environments, uh, maybe the size of a bread box that might be a down to class one, if that's what you need. Uh, the goal is to also provide you very quiet spaces, because from perspective of nanotech, a micron is 1,000 nanometers. A speck of dust is the size of a boulder compared to my device, right? So I need to go ahead and get rid of the dust. That's obvious. That's cleaning of the air. Um, the vibration-wise, I need to make sure my instruments do not wiggle as I'm looking at atoms. So we'll have um, uh, so-called uh, VCE uh, level of vibration uh, easily available to us. And that's a good enough. Actually, most modern nanofabs live at that level of vibration criteria E. Um, we actually have then a capability, if we want to, to uh, put active or passive uh, vibration isolation to reach another two levels below that, which is known as VCG level. And that's as long uh, as, and, and, I mean, for, as we look at our crystal ball, for the next 20 years, that's about, I think, what we need. Um, can, do we need to go beyond that? If we do, again, we'll have anti-gravity. We'll figure it out in 20 years. But for right now, we, we believe that that re meets our needs uh, of anything that we rationally should be able to do. We will not handle radioactive materials inside here. That's another thing that would be good to point out what's not going to be in here. But we do have other sites on campus that can do that. OK, Ben? Yeah, so I had um, two questions. Um, the first was um, sparked by something you said earlier around uh, nanotech fab labs. I was wondering if you had some sort of nanotech cookbook. Like you mentioned half a dozen different things, surface, pro surface controls, um, et cetera, like these various different things you could do. And the, the second question was actually pushing your statement around clean rooms. I mean, you know, each of us is a huge nano factory. Right, of all sorts of things that are made inside of your body, and are you, how are we incorporating uh, biological nano machines into this project? Excellent. Uh, so, from perspective of a cookbook, uh, we have uh, uh, classes that we're developing, such as uh, Nanomaker. It's a class that lets you uh, take raspberry juice and tea, some suntan lotion uh, and make a solar cell out of it, for example, or uh, take a DVD grating and uh, your iPhone and make a spectrometer, or uh, take the um, 
lighting, uh, the lighter for your grill that has a piezoelectric element in it and use it to power a paste that is uh, the AC tin film uh, EL uh, material. So we do have, call it experiments, and we're working with the Edgerton Center. I, I developed the class together with Professor Rajiv Ram uh, called the Nanomaker, and we are now uh, working with the Edgerton Center, which is the center that reaches out into high schools to develop a series of modules that indeed would be transferable and would expose you to the nanoscale. From perspective of uh, having a cookbook, that's the beginning of that cookbook. I think the opportunity is very, very broad. And so engaging additional contributors, making it an open source type of uh, environment where people can con con contribute their lessons or their ways of treating the nanoscale in very innovative new ways, indeed would be a very powerful thing to have. I think, actually, personally, I think what would be also an amazing new environment to work in would be the kitchen of the future. Because in the kitchen, right, you can explore the nanoscale sense, the nanoscale tastes, the nanoscale textures. You can figure out the nanoscale structure on top of your bread that might make it into moth butterfly because it serves as a diffraction grating for particular colors. You know, there are so many things you can imagine doing, and it has to be edible, right? So it gets to be exciting. So that might be an entirely new form of a maker environment that we haven't yet quite thought of, but can get us to the chemistry. Uh, material science, physics, that otherwise we don't typically work on. very new way of thinking for most people. I agree. I agree. Uh, and then your uh, second question was? Just the bio side of things. Oh, yeah, the bio side of things. Uh, the, uh, there will be plenty of tools inside MIT Nano that accommodate ability to handle biological specimens. We don't have bio level two labs in here. Uh, so uh, much of, actually, if you look at today's micro nanofabs at MIT that are built on a CMOS factory type model, uh, about a quarter of the use is for making microfluidic systems mm -hmm. uh, that are used typically in biology um, and chemistry and chemical engineering. So um, already today, uh, with today's tool sets, we are accommodating the needs for the bio world. Uh, there will be additional ones that we're imagining might be quite useful, but you know, give us a couple of years to finalize. Thanks. Sure. Yes? Yeah, so you talked through some examples of nanotechnology around the properties of materials and how that's a benefit. And you also talked about new kinds of tools you could build with nanotechnology. My question is, what about building robots? Can we build nanotechnological devices where you could program them and they could be you know, active in, in doing something at maybe nanotech or maybe at least a, a you know, micro scale? Well, we, we already do that, right, in the form of medicine. N medicine is, a, you can say, a nanorobot. It has a purpose to identify the uh, uh, illness inside your body and, and uh, attach itself to it and expel it out of your body. So we already do that. It's just, you know, the, the idea of having moving parts that are down on nanoscale, unless you tell me why we need that, you know, <laughs> it's kind of hard to understand why would you think about nanorobot as being a functional, useful functional form on the nanoscale. Um, you can also look at the muscles, the way they operate, right? They have a ratchet system that lets, them, it lets us contract and expand the muscles. That's a nanorobot right there. So we use nanorobots, under quotes, already, right? If you define a robot as an item that's nanoscale size, it has a particular purpose it needs to, it needs to, to deliver. Um, if you want to reprogram it, well, easier thing to do is just throw that away, that medicine away and take a new medicine to do a particular second function you want to do. So that's, we already do use nanorobots, just we don't often call them that. I have one. Yep. 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 That, there was yep. one right there. Yep. Um, thank you for your really nice talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned a lot of cross-departmental collaboration at MIT Nano. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask about cross-institutional collaboration. Like, what is uh, this program's attitude going to be towards, like, collaborating with other institutions, um, maybe even international institutions. Absolutely. Like that. um, that's a great question. Um, I guess I'll highlight that right now uh, about 10% of the income of Harvard's NanoFab comes from MIT accounts. Okay. Uh, and also I'll, hi I'll highlight, and I do not know the number, but many, many of the Harvard engineering students get their education in MIT labs. Um, as an example of a collaboration with a neighbor, but that's an obvious one. We're just down the street from each other. Um, the, you will find that already on campus, the best mode of engaging uh, the world is uh, by having people participate at MIT. Uh, simply said, um, most effective co co company collaborations is when a company sends us an employee and they stay on campus for a period, not of a day, but of a year, 
or more years. And that actually, they become incredible magnet for our students, for the company. They become an incredible source of what really matters in the world. I often emphasize that as a university, as an institute, we can solve any problem. We just do not know what the heck to work on, right? Because we never have enough time to really look outside the walls and ask you know, deep questions on what truly matters. So we make a guess and we imagine an entirely new world rather than solving the most pressing problems. Now because industry doesn't necessarily know how to share it all the most pressing problems with us, is it because of secrecy or because languages might be different or because expectation of opportunities and capabilities might not be understood. So embedding industry inside the campus is extremely valuable from perspective of interaction. Beyond that though, our colleagues around the world have tremendous amount of vastly important technologies we should know about. So a lot of the space inside MIT Nano is enabling us to actually ask people from around the world who want to work with us to come by and actually have joint projects within the space. Yeah. Right there. Thank you. Um, actually, I had a couple questions. Uh, one was a follow-on to the uh, nano robots question, and I, would, and I sure. couldn't help but thinking of ribosomes and things like that as nano robots that may be programmed to do a whole bunch of interesting things <laughs> like, like they do. And, but it sounded like you were sort of dismissive of that um, I'm no. sorry, maybe I misinterpreted. No, no, it. no, I, I, I guess I, 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 guess I, I, I guess I look at the word robot, uh, and I, I don't know why we necessarily use that as a word yeah, that, okay. that, that, that sure. defines nanoscale, because we already have, if the function of a robot is to perform a function that for which we program it, we do that already with nanoscale items. So the robot is, uh, you know, I, I think a misnomer, because it, it evokes something that we can some, you know, an item that is livable, that's living inside us and is doing stuff. Well, just like microbes and much of our biome is, right. you know, full of microbes. It's the very same thing. They all have functions that, that, to digest our food, to do right. whatever else, right? right. So uh, the robot itself is just a one, one, one word that it could be misunderstood or could invoke other kinds of thinking. So I, I like to equate it to very simple things that people usually use. Fair enough, actually. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I was thinking of it as just a machine. So I, yeah, yeah. I, I get it, right? Yeah, yeah. No, um, and also, if you notice, a lot of my talk was to emphasize the fact that, you know, nanotechnology is one of these things people sometimes are scared of. And I emphasize the fact that nanotech is something we have used all the time. It's the way the world is put together. It's the way we are put together. We finally understand that. And as a result, we finally can understand what is happening inside us and what is happening around the world that we've been doing all along. And we can go one step beyond and actually make plants that live, that you know, are more productive. We are, can go one step beyond and make better environment for us because we realize the following things are damaging the planet or not. I mean, right. so it's really just the insights that provide us through the use of nanoscience, nanotechnology. Okay, thanks. Of well, course. so the other question was on a sort of completely different scale. Um, I, you know, I I like the idea of the getting the last 10% of the ketchup out of the bottle, even though that's kind of a gross looking uh, <laughs> image. But, but I, I was just imagining all the uh, stuff that moves by, by sea or by air um, and the energy that goes into just overcoming the friction between these things and wondering whether there's a future there for those sorts of layers on the outside, say, of ships or airplanes. Yeah, or, or uh, indeed, this has been proposed for de-icing as mm -hmm. one of the applications that would be very valuable, right? Um, beyond that, in surgery, um, uh, you know, many of the joints, uh, for example, artificial joints eventually do have issues with uh, uh, friction between the elements of the joint. Is this a way to uh, improve that, right? I mean, there are a variety of uh, things. I, I was talking to a Kripa not long ago, actually, the other night I gave him a ride, and he was telling me about the way it can assist a variety of surgeries and a variety of ways people, when people operate on, on um, anything with blood, apparently, uh, the moment you touch blood with a typical instrument, it will start coagulating. And that process of coagulation is not quite necessarily understood. Well, can these kinds of coatings assist you with that? I mean, there are many, many, many opportunities that you can uh, go ahead and start applying if you understand the basic nanoscience of uh, interfaces, which this really gets to the bottom of. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Yes, please. Hi. Um, so I had a question related to the makerspace aspect. And yeah. I think most people can agree that um, if you have a solution, you should start with a problem. So I was wondering if there's any like showcasing or accessibility, because um, nanotechnology is something that not a lot of people know a lot about outside of the research community. Um, and 
accessibility is really important for making sure that people come to you with the problems so that yeah. they, can, they can do that. So um, is there something incorporated in yeah. the building um, for that? Uh, there, are, there are a number of things uh, that are both in the building and in the innovation initiative itself as well as campus-wide. Um, so let me just give you a couple because there are a lot. <laughs> so uh, the, the building itself it will have a museum, right, a gallery, and that is actually curated in collaboration with the MIT Museum. One of the recent features of the MIT Museum is that there is a section of it now with student projects that rotate every six months to a year. Uh, a number of those are nano-related projects, and they are designed so the public can truly understand what is it that we are doing. You, we, together with the uh, Boston Museum of Science, uh, we have started for past several years sending our students uh, to um, take a class from them on what it means to present to general public science and technology. And there are some really cute and cool videos that, as one of the byproducts of the class, the students make. Um, I don't remember the, I, the word geek is in the title on YouTube. If you, it's like a geek something channel on YouTube. Um, uh, if you look for Excitonics Center is one of the participants, maybe with it, within it you'll see a whole bunch of cool videos that uh, talk about the way excitons work, the way solar cells work, and all that <coughs> stuff. So those are just a couple of examples. And then we have um, also, uh, in collaboration uh, with the Industrial Liaison Program, recently they started what is known as a startup exchange, which is essentially companies can anonymously go and post their problems. It's like a dating service, <laughs> right? Anonymously. <laughs> uh, anonymously post your problems, and uh, the startups can anonymously post their solutions, and if the match is right, we'll introduce one to the other, <laughs> and consequently, hopefully, provide solutions that uh, would not have otherwise been matched. Is uh, there a moderator for that? Industrial so, Liaison Program. Okay. Um, there are 225 uh, companies that are members of ILP, Industrial Liaison Program, and there are plenty of startups in the Boston, Cambridge area. Just out of curiosity, like short answer. Um, yeah. Do you know? It, I know it's a far way off, but do you know if there are going to be programs for people who are, or like non-research people, to learn more about stuff, or is that not really yeah. in the plan? Well, I mean, okay. I, you know, uh, in which way do you think? Like, just maybe like hands-on, not like get in a bunny suit, go into the fab, but um, just programs for more hands-on for like kids or something like that. Sure. Um, so. Uh, through the MIT Museum, uh, one of the opportunities is to imagine, can we generate modules that could be transferable? I mean, there are teaching um, opportunities within the museum itself, right? And the re reason why museum is a good vehicle is because it's accessible, right? Um, and then on top of that, the Edgerton Center is doing a tremendous job in reaching out to K through 12, as well as the Lemelson Center, um, uh, Lemelson MIT Center uh, at MIT. Uh, so those are you know, vehicles towards reaching to the public that's a little bit younger and uh, hence a little bit easier to explain things at a level that would make them amazing scientists when they step into MIT. I'm glad you're doing that. Ah, thank you. OK, we'll do one more question, but I'll let you know that, of course, uh, the dean will remain for a little while yeah, afterwards, sure. right? So if I you wanted to come up and ask flight, the question so. <laughs> later on, but this will give some people a chance to, sure. to head back. So last question. Here we go. Anna. Thank you. Um, that was awesome. Oh, I thank you. look forward to visiting. <laughs> I'm curious, how do you think nanotechnology will affect global supply chains? Oh, um, well, it, it's a fantastic question. It's a very complex question because a global supply chain definition can be interpreted in a number of ways. Um, already, I would claim that the world is extremely globalized. And you know, I spend a lot of time understanding the solar technology. And you can say, well, who's making money in solar? Actually, a lot of the guys who make the very basic materials are right now making money on solar, despite the fact the actual manufacturers are losing money making the solar cells. Um, and, and you can then go ahead and balance between, you know, where do the suppliers of the basic materials reside, U.S., rest of the world, where do the manufacturers reside, China. So you can go ahead and say, well, who's making money here and how is this global supply chain affecting each other and supporting each other? Um, I think you will see this over and over again. Is, is it in solar business, in display business, in lighting, whatever it is, there's a tremendous intermingling of uh, nano elements already between different areas of the world because there are you know, abundant resources of one or other kind in different places. So will it affect it any more than it's already affecting it? In a different way, I would say. I don't think that there is a fundamental change that we should expect because nanotechnology is here. And that is because nanotech is really just the same as math or computing. It is so omnipresent and so applicable in everything we do that it's been around already for such a long time that you shouldn't see any kind of tectonic shift I think you'll see a tectonic shift in our understanding of it, 
And hence, we'll start saying, oh, you know, I can fix that problem with nanotech before I use the chisel and the hammer. Now, now I can do it with nanotech, right? Now, that's, I think, going to be the fundamental change in what you're going to observe. But thank you for the question. Okay, so we're going to real quickly do some thank yous here. Uh, before I do that, Joe, would you switch over? I think you're going to do it.